So last time we discussed the trace formula for an anisotropic group and its stabilization. And I tried to give, indicate the argument, first of all, what the problem is, and then indicate the argument of how you uh, stabilize the trace formula. Today we're going to discuss the setting where G is general, connected to reductive group over Q. And basically we're going to try to do the same thing, except now the situation becomes much more complicated. And so um, I won't be able to give the same level of detail that I gave last time. There's much more to do. So my goal here would be to give you kind of a feeling for the map of the subject. So what are the major steps? Uh, what is the general idea so that uh, if you're interested you can go and read the details on your own but I don't think I'll be able to provide many details today it would more be of an impressionistic picture of what is going on so the basic plan is to discuss the following uh, stages of the trace formula the first one is the non-invariant trace formula. I'll say what this means when we're discussing it. The second stage is the invariant trace formula. And the third stage is the stable trace formula. And then number four, I would like to finally give you an application of this theory to classical groups. Okay, so that's, this is the basic plan. Okay, so uh, let me first spend a few minutes discussing what are the issues when G is uh, no longer anisotropic. Okay, so the first immediate issue that you're faced with is that the L2 space no longer decomposes discreetly. And in the talk of Erez Lapid, we saw the spectral decomposition of the L2 space in general. So it has two components. It's the part that does decompose discreetly. And then it is the other part, if you will, the complement, which we may call the continuous spectrum. And if you think about the operator RF that we discussed last time, uh, it is going to have, be of trace class here, but in general it will not have a trace on this part of the spectrum that is the continuous spectrum. And moreover, this continuous spectrum can be described in terms of Levy subgroups as the parabolic induction of the discrete spectrum of the corresponding Levy. And then one takes oh, invariance or coinvariance under the vowel group. And this identity here is realized by the theory of Eisenstein series. And where is the continuity here? The continuity here is because this part, now maybe G is even semi-simple, but even then M is going to be reductive and no longer that, it's going to have a split part in its center. And so maybe I'll just, already this piece here is a direct integral over the characters of the center, the unitary characters of the center. And so this is where the continuous nature of the continuous spectrum comes from. So this is the problem we see on the spectral side that we're looking, we're trying to get the trace of an operator that does not have a trace. And what about the geometric side? Well, we saw last time that the geometric side, the, what we found, the terms that we found there were volumes 
of centralizers and then orbital integrals. So on the geometric side, in G of Q, we now have many more elements. So when the group was anisotropic, the only elements we had were semi-simple and elliptic, which means that their centralizers were also anisotropic. But now we have semi-simple elements that are non-elliptic, and we have unipotent elements, and of course we have mixtures of those two things. So how do these uh, kinds of elements, what kind of trouble do they cause? Well, the non-elliptic semi-simple elements will cause the trouble that the volume of the corresponding centralizer is going to be infinite. So, uh, and the unipotent elements are going to cause the problem that their orbital integral is going to be infinite. So there is trouble on both sides of the trace formula, and of course those troubles are related. So what, was the, what does one do? Uh, Pierre-André Chaudois discussed in his talk that uh, what... So both of these are um, reflected in the fact that when you form the automorphic kernel and you try to integrate it over the diagonal, this integral is not going to exist. And uh, Pierre-André explained to us that uh, the idea due to Langlands and Arthur is to modify this kernel by truncating it, which means that uh, basically chop off the parts of it that go out to infinity, not chop them off in a really brutal way, but chop them off so that they become sufficiently quickly decreasing, and then uh, the integral converges. Uh, P. Andri gave a formula for the truncated kernel. I'm not going to repeat the formula because it takes a little bit of time to, uh, to write, but instead I'm going to now go into uh, what happens when you do the integration. So this is truncation, and that leads to the non-invariant trace formula. All right, so when we integrate this truncated kernel over the diagonal, what we end up with is a distribution And this distribution has a geometric and spectral expansion. And in the beginning, the geometric and spectral expansions look like this. On this side, we have a sum over certain geometric classes. What are those? So these are equivalence classes of uh, elements of G of Q where the equivalence relation is conjugacy of their semi-simple parts. Such elements have a Jordan decomposition, and two elements are deemed equivalent if their semi-simple parts are conjugate, uh, which is obviously more crude than what we would like. We would like to have actual conjugacy classes and not conjugacy classes of their semi-simple parts. But the reason we cannot do this uh, has to do with the way the kernel is being truncated and the fact that in the truncation you're integrating over unipotent radicals of levies, and so you have this whole the, the, the unipotent element needs to run, you cannot fix it. Um, and on the other side, you have a spectral decomposition. Uh, and here, this runs over what are called cuspidal data. What is a cuspidal datum? It's a pair of P and sigma, where P and G is a parabolic subgroup and sigma is a cuspidal automorphic representation Sorry. of the Levy subgroup or the Levy quotient of this parabolic. Okay, so this is what is called the coarse expansion. And it is just a first step towards the trace formula. Now, this looks, this looks kind of fairly abstract at the moment. Um, Pierre-Henri discussed the fact that uh, if you fix f as a function of t, this is going to be polynomial. 
And it is initially only defined for large values of this truncating parameter t, but after you prove that it's polynomial, you can evaluate anywhere you like. And so we're going to set t to a certain magic value. And the magic value is often 0. For example, when g is gln or sln and so forth. Uh, but in general, the magic value, um, I can point you in the Q&A or afterwards where you find the formula for, or I can write down the formula. But the point is, the reason there is a magic value is because there is usually a discrepancy when you try to lift the vowel element to the normalizer, you can desire that it be a, a Q rational point in the normalizer or that it lie in the maximal compact subgroup that you've chosen. And sometimes you can arrange that both are true at the same time and sometimes you cannot. Uh, and this is where this comes from. Okay, so from, and when we set this to this magic value, we drop the t from the notation. Okay, so this is the course expansion. Let's see. Uh, hmm, this is challenging. So some of the distributions that occur in the course expansion have fairly straightforward formulas. So let me, let me show what these formulas are. So in the special case, when gamma, well, when O uh, consists of regular semi-simple elliptic elements, then this G of O is what we already saw before. So this is the volume of the centralizer, the automorphic quotient of the centralizer, with the small proviso that you put this upper one here. And then the orbital integral that we saw from last time. And on the spectral side, when chi consists of a cuspidal automorphic representation of G rather than a Levy subgroup of G, then this J chi is the multiplicity with which this cuspidal representation appears times the trace against the test function f. So these are exactly the terms that we saw in the anisotropic case in the trace formula. The difference now is that we have many more terms there and would like to understand them. And so understanding these terms is uh, what is called um, going towards the fine expansion. So I'm going to talk about this in a moment. But maybe before I do this, let me give you an example of a, of, of a term here that is not of this nature, so that you can get maybe a little bit of a feeling. So the example is going to be for the group SL2. And I'm going to take uh, an equivalence class that is the exact opposite of the equivalence classes we're considering here. Namely, O is going to be the set of all unipotent elements. This is an equivalence class. Their semi-simple parts are the identity and they're all conjugate to each other. So what happens in that situation? Then this J of O has two parts. One part is fairly simple. It's just the volume of the whole group, which if you normalize things, if you use a Tamagawa measure, it's just going to be one times the value of your test function at one plus, and now comes something interesting. This is the finite part at s equal to 0 of the following function that you cook up by modifying the orbital integral. So we're going to integrate your test function along the orbit. Ah, I have to tell you what is gamma. Gamma represents, so gamma is this unipotent element. Uh, you do this, but
you insert something here. So I have to, I have to explain what is a finite part and what is this. The finite part is easy to say. This is going to be a meromorphic function in S, and this is going to be the constant term in the Laurent expansion at s equal to 0 of this meromorphic function that is actually not, will end up not being holomorphic, it will have a pole. Um, and then what is this here? So this function hb is a function on the adelic points of our group and it goes to the real numbers and measures in some sense the non-compactness of this ga or ga over gq. So how does this work? Well, we have the Iwasawa decomposition, which writes GA as the product of the unipotent radical of the standard Borel, the torus of the standard Borel, and then a maximal compact subgroup. Here we can take SO2R times SL2 of Z hat. So we're taking the standard maximal compact everywhere. This T is the diagonal maximal torus we can just uh, identify with R cross. And this is the, you know, group of unipotent matrices with the daily coefficients. And then this function is going to take a point that is decomposed according to the Ozawa decomposition, and it's going to take the log of the adelic absolute value of this Toro component. Uh, why did I write R cross? I apologize, this is A cross. Yes. Okay. This is SO2. Say again? Integration. Oh, yes, sorry. Otherwise, I'll, yes, I have to, thank you. I have to switch, I have to make sure that I hit all the unipotent, all the regular unipotent elements by this integral. So I have to integrate over GL2 for this. Yes. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, this is in some sense a regularization of this orbital integral. So what we're noticing, Let us think about what is the value of this function z at 0. Well, the value of this function z at 0, that would be this orbital integral, um, which is a product of all the local orbital integrals. But each local orbital integral, you can check that it basically behaves like the local zeta factor at 1. And so this is going to behave like the zeta function at 1. Uh, sorry, uh, yes, at 1, which has a pole. So this doesn't exist. And this procedure here is some regularized version of that. And I'm going to come back to this. Uh, a little bit later. Okay. So now let us discuss how to rewrite this course expansion in what is
just the orbital integral. But let me give you an example that we have not discussed so far uh, for a proper Levy subgroup. So here we're going to take gamma to be a semi-simple element of a Levy subgroup, and it has to have the property that the centralizer in that Levy subgroup is the same as the centralizer in the whole group. And it is also not contained in a smaller Levy subgroup. So we can maybe call this GM regular in that the, the what, you know, gamma may be allowed to be singular, but the singularity should be fully captured in M and not be seen outside of M. And then in that situation, this coefficient is again just the volume of the centralizer and the distribution that we're looking at is again an orbital integral with one difference that we're not just integrating the function over the orbit, but we have put in here a certain term called the weight factor. And this weight factor uh, can be given fairly explicitly. You have a certain collection of points in a finite dimensional real vector space, and you take the convex hull and then the volume of that. Okay? Maybe I won't go into details about this. So this is a prototypical example of what is called a weighted orbital integral. Okay, so that is just one. This is the simplest version of a weighted orbital integral. The more general weighted orbital integrals that occur here, uh, for which do not satisfy this property, they do not look like this. Instead, they're obtained by moving your element gamma with the sufficiently regular element of the center of the Levy so that you can achieve this property, and then trying to take the limit back towards gamma, realizing that this limit doesn't exist and then replacing this orbital integral by a linear combination of such where the singularities cancel out, and then you take the limit. So it's a more complicated procedure, um, and I'll just leave it to that. I can point you to uh, the right reference if you want to learn more about this. But I'll give an example with, I'll give an example with SO2 again in a moment about what this looks like in a particular case. What does fine refer to? Fine refers to the fact that you have refined uh, the, uh, the set O of equivalence classes into a set of conjugacy classes, and you have also uh, refined your understanding of the distribution JO by giving, in some sense, a more explicit formula, like uh, in this situation you have this weighted orbital integral, or more generally have this limit of uh, of uh, linear combinations. And finally, it also refers to the fact that these weighted orbital integrals, whether those explicit versions or their limit versions, they satisfy the so-called splitting formulas that expresses them in terms of local distributions. Whereas this is not immediately clear about these more coarser JOs and JKs. There are none of these things, well, some happen to be invariant by accident, but most of those are not invariant, and the invariance is ruined by this weight factor over there. So this, that's why we'll have the next topic of the invariant trace formula. So let me give you an example on the spectral side. Um, here we're going to consider now, uh, what are we going to consider? We're going to consider sigma, um, I want to consider the GM regular case uh, on the spectral side. And the GM regular case on the spectral side is going to be M sigma, where sigma is a cuspidal automorphic representation of M. But now the GM regular part is going to be that uh, the, stable, uh, the stabilizer in the vowel group 
of this cuspid automorphic representation is just going to be m. m, of course, stabilizes it because it's a representation of m. And then in that case, uh, the coefficient here is again just going to be the multiplicity in the spectrum of m, and then this uh, weighted character is going to be an integral, the same kind of integral that we saw, I think I raised it when we were discussing the continuous spectrum, so over the same space here. And going to, we're going to have basically the trace of the induced representation, but as we're moving this representation along the imaginary axis here, and we're twisting it by unitary characters, but again, just like with the weighted orbital integral, there is going to be a weighted uh, weight factor here, which is going to be of spectral nature. So this is going to be a, um, a operator valued weight factor. So this is an operator on this representation. And again, this operator is going to ruin invariance of this distribution. Okay, so maybe this is now a little bit uh, too formal. So let me give you some examples of this. Again, with the group SL2. Mm. Is this board visible like this? People are nodding. Okay, let me know. Say again? Oh yeah, I missed the bracket on the ba on the end of it. Thank you. There is another. So you're composing those two operators and you're taking their trace. Okay, so let's look at the example of SO2. All right, so the first thing I want to do is I want to look at this unipotent contribution that I, uh, that I wrote up right here, in fact. And I want to see how this is going to fit into this formula of the fine expansion on the geometric side. Okay, so let's, let's consider, so what is the, how do you get the finite part of this function? What do you do? You multiply this function just by s and then you differentiate and this would be the constant term. This would be the finite part. Now what we can do is we can fix S large finite set of places. What does large mean? It means that outside of this set, uh, all the data we have is unramified. So in particular, the test function, which we can uh, imagine to be a product of uh, local test functions, is the uh, characteristic function of the integral points. And then we can write this z, we can decompose it as the part at s and the part away from s. And then we can perform this by the, we can compute this by the product formula for derivatives. And then we're going to, oh, let me first do so. We have the value of this at zero, and I'm going to take this variable s, and I'm going to put it into this part. This part was a problematic part because it goes over infinitely many places. This part is the less problematic part because there's only finitely many places. And maybe I forgot to tell you, but unipotent orbital integrals do converge at every place, so in particular their product over finitely many places converges. Um, so this actually does exist. And then we have the derivative at s equals zero of what is remaining here. And then we have plus the derivative that's equal zero of this function times the evaluation of this. And now this is going to be a regular, a usual 
unipotent orbital integral. So this would be, in the refined expansion, the part for the conjugacy class of the unipotent element for g. And this makes sense because we have finite in many places, where this here is the coefficient in front of it. So this is going to be a g of u. This does not depend on f because our set of places is so large that f has become the indicator function. And then here, this is going to be this weighted orbital integral for the element 1 for the torus. And here you can kind of see this limiting behavior that I kind of alluded to in the definition of these distributions. And this is the coefficient <coughs> here. OK. So that's a geometric. Let me give you an example on the spectral side. So on the spectral side, again, we have SO2. So what are these cuspidal data? Well, unless it's a cuspidal representation of G, it's the maximal torus T and a character of it, a, a Grossian character, basically. And when is it GM regular? GM regular is equivalent to M mu squared not equal to 1 because the vowel group acts by inversion, and it's only the quadratic characters that are fixed. So in the GM regular case, I'm just going to specialize the formula that I gave you over here so that you can see what this curly MP looks like in a special case. This curly MP, so the integral, is over the real line, in this case this am star is just r, and I'm going to put the i, the complex i, into the formula here. And what we have is the trace of the standard intertwining operator at it inverse times the standard intertwining operator at it derivative. So this curly mp becomes the logarithmic derivative of the standard intertwining operator. And then you have the parabolic induction of this character, but then twisted by the unramified character it at f. d t. So that's it. What about the non-GM regular case, for which I haven't given you a formula yet? Non-GM regular case. It's the same thing. Let me not write it again. Plus an additional contribution. And the additional contribution, there is a certain positive constant in front, let me forget about it, times the trace of the intertwining operator, self-intertwining operator, of combined with the parabolic induction. OK. So you see here something interesting, that in general, the, ah, oh no, it's tragedy. Um, the spectral side of the fine expansion looks like an integral, but some parts of this integral are of discrete nature. So the continuous spectrum can give discrete contributions to the spectral side. And this is very important because this is, uh, in the end, we would like to extract from this spectral side exactly what we want, namely the trace of a discrete spectrum. But it come pack comes packaged with a lot more things. But what we could do is we can take this distribution and take its discrete pieces, and this is going to get us much closer to the thing that we really want, the trace of R on the discrete spectrum. But we're going to see a few more things. So let's put that all together. Sorry, I'm being crawled on by some, some guy here, very eager to learn about the trace formula. What? I excluded the case mu equals 1 because you're going to get the residual part there too, yeah. Okay. So this leads us to the discrete part of the spectral site. The discrete part of the spectral site is what you get by taking the discrete contributions to all of these integrals. 
and it take, takes the following form. Okay, it is again a sum over Levis, the same normalizing factor in front. And then we have a sum over the vial group for this Levy, but only the regular points of it. Now, maybe let, let me say a, a little word about what this is. So this vial group acts on this real vector space that has been coming up and up. Um, it was defined at some point. Let, let me remind you what this is. This is the co-characters of the split part of the center of the Levy module, the split part of the center of the G tensored up to R. This vial group acts on it, and the regular part is precisely those elements that have no non-trivial fixed points here. If we have such an element, we can take the determinant of W minus 1 on this vector space. And um, then I'll continue my formula down here. We have the trace of the global intertwining operator composed with the induced representation. And here I'm inducing the entire discrete spectrum of the lady. So this is the discrete part of the spectral side of the trace formula. The part, so it has a part m equals to g that gives you precisely the trace of rf acting on L2 discrete of g. But then we also have other parts for smaller m's, and they come from discrete contributions coming from the continuous spectrum, from these singular uh, pieces of the continuous spectrum. Okay, oh boy. Um, now I spent a lot of time, so this is, I want to end here uh, my discussion of the non-invariant trace formula, and it was already mentioned that the distributions in the non-invariant trace formula are not invariant because of the weight factors, scalar weight factors on the geometric side, operator weight factors on the spectral side. Um, but we would like to have a trace formula that involves invariant distributions. Uh, why would we like to do this? Because oftentimes a test function is not given to you as a function, it's just given to you by specifying what are its orbital integrals. And then you wouldn't be able to apply a non-invariant trace formula to such a test function. Yes, yes. So the functions, are the, the, the uh, distributions there are called J to emphasize that they're not invariant. This fellow turns out to be invariant already, and it is also going to be the discrete part of the invariant trace formula too. Uh, but the other, the continuous parts on the spectral side and the corresponding parts on the geometric side, they're not invariant. Very good. So we're going to basically uh, take the same philosophy as we did last time with the stabilization, and we're going to apply it to the problem of non-invariance. So you can compute how non-invariant each of these JMs is. These are called the so-called variance formulas. And when you compute the difference between JM and its conjugate, what you're going to find out is that this is a sum of similar kinds of distributions over proper Levy subgroups. So the, while they fail to be invariant, they fail to be invariant uh, in lower order. There is no G term that occurs as an error. The errors are only associated to proper Levy subgroups. Not only that, but when you compute the variance formula for the geometric distribution and the spectral distribution, you see that they have the exact same structure. And so that tells you, okay, uh, maybe the approach to making them invariant is to mix them up in a judicious way so that the non-invariance cancels. But now you have a few, the following philosophical unpleasantry you have to deal with, that you have mixed geometric and spectral information, which means that in the resulting trace formula, there is not going to be a purely geometric and a purely spectral side because the information is going to be muddied between the two, but that's something you have to live with, or at least 
Uh, maybe one of you or is going to tell us how not to live with that, uh, but this is our life for now. So uh, here is, ah, so this is now the invariant trace formula. And so this is the basic theorem that describes the invariant trace formula. I'm going to lie a little bit in this theorem uh, and I'll tell you roughly where I'm lying. So the map, I'm going to give it a name, phi mg, it's going to be the map that associates to the function f its weighted character for some representation pi and I'm going to leave pi as a variable here. And I'm going to then say that this is, is well-defined continuous map, I'm not saying at all what the topologies are, from the test functions on G to invariant test functions on the levy. What are invariant test functions on the levy? Maybe I, want, I need to say a few words about this. So if you look at test functions on a group, you can form all of their regular semi-simple orbital integrals. Or you can form all of their tempered characters. And it turns out that those two collections of objects determine each other. Which means that if one of the collections consists entirely of zeros, then the other collection consists entirely of zeros. So that defines for you a notion of negligible functions. Functions all of whose orbital integrals regular semi-simple vanish. Or functions all of whose tempered characters vanish. And this space i is the quotient of the space of test functions by those negligible functions. And you're going to expect that an invariant distribution is one that factors precisely through this space. And now I'm thinking of this in the variable pi as a function in here. Because I'm thinking of the interpretation of this space as functions on tempered characters. And this is now going to help me modify the distributions j to make invariant distribution. So the second statement is there exist unique invariant distributions i g m gamma f i g m pi f which are determined by the following formulas. The non-invariant distribution can be expressed over levies, as a sum over levies between m and g of those invariant distributions, where we send our test function down to the invariant distribution by this map phi. And because these distributions are invariant, they're going to factor through this space of test function for invariant distributions. And so this makes sense. And the exact same identity holds for the spectral distributions. Oh, that should be an M here. Okay. Now, if you stare at this for a little, Next you're... Phi, LG, right? phi, yes, thank you, phi from G down to L. From G down to L, thank you. Okay, Can so... You say again how you're doing this on, on the left, the how, well, this is a function of M in the sense that it's in a quotient space of test functions. By those test functions where all their regular semi-simple orbital integrals vanish or all their tempered characters vanish. Um, and this, this space can be thought of as, uh, as a space of functions on the pi's. And then this is a function in terms of a pi. And so that's why how it becomes a function here. Huh? Well, why is that a function of pi? Oh, this is what I mean by this. So I'm sending this to, if you want, I'm sending this f to a function that accepts a pi. This is, this thing accepts a representation of M by its very definition. Is the, the 
Yes. But, but this is how it was defined. What you feed into this is not a representation of G, it's a representation of M. Okay, so when you look at this, you realize that these formulas actually give you the definition of the invariant distribution inductively. Because if you imagine you knew what to do for all levies which are not equal to G, then this formula tells you what to do for L equals to G, and that defines for you IMG. But then you have to prove that what you have is an invariant distribution. This is not too hard because you use the variance formulas that I mentioned and the fact that the variance formulas are parallel for the geometric and spectral side. What is a little bit more complicated is the fact that we act don't really know the fact that any invariant distribution factors through this space. This is a technical point. So there is another technical term called being supported on characters. And it's conjecturally the same as invariant, but the conjecture is not known. So uh, some effort needs to be spent to actually prove that these things are not just invariant, but supported on characters. And that's a somewhat technical matter, but it can be done. And the other thing I like here is that you, in order to really make this work, you need to change your spaces of test functions. With the standard spaces, uh, you get into analytic difficulties. So there are some pages uh, devoted to, you know, straightening out these technical details, but I don't want to go into them because this is the spirit of what's going on. Um, and then we're basically done with the invariant trace formula because now we have the following theorem, which kind of suggests itself that we have the decomposition of the non-invariant trace formula into a sum for G, into a sum over levies of, well, the same normalizing factor that I keep writing every time. And then the invariant, this, the, an invariant distribution on L. And what is this invariant distribution? This invariant distribution is what you get by replacing in the geometric and spectral expansions, all the j's by the i's. All right, so this, as you can guess, this is a fairly formal process now. Once you've constructed these i's and established their properties, so you have a geometric and spectral expansion of this now invariant distribution, which we're going to call the invariant trace formula. OK. All right. This is all quite formal. And now we come to the discussion of the stable trace formula. And it will have to be equally formal because the details become horrendous. And I'm going to just give you the formal structure and I'm going to try, given time, give you an example with SL2 as to how some things fit together. So we come here to the stable trace formula. The formal idea is exactly the same as with the invariant trace formula. We study what is, why is the distribution that is the trace formula not stable and what is its failure to be stable. And we discover that its failure to be stable can be understood in terms of error terms that are supported on groups smaller than G. In the case of invariance, those were Levy subgroups and in the case of stability, those are the endoscopic groups. Uh, we went kind of in a fairly detailed way through the motions last time for the anisotropic group. Here, let me focus more on the formal aspect of it. So here's the theorem. Again, we have a decomposition of the invariant trace formula this time into a sum over endoscopic groups of stable distributions. I've switched now to Arthur's notation, where the endoscopic groups are 
denoted by g prime. This is a stable distribution on g prime, and this f prime is the endoscopic transfer of f, which is something I discussed last time. Uh, and now, where these distributions, they have a maybe what we might call a geometric and spectral site, even though by now these, uh, these words have completely lost their meaning in some sense. So where SG is a stable distribution, uh, which has two expansions. One of the expansions, again, has the same structure as a sum over Levy subgroups. And then there is a sum over stable conjugacy classes, and there are certain coefficients, and then certain stable distributions that are the stable analogs of the invariant distributions i or the non-invariant distributions j. So this is the, you can call the geometric side because at least uh, it's uh, a sum over conjug uh, conjugacy classes. And then there is the spectral side where you have an integral over formal parameters. Now, I don't want to know, I don't want to say much about what formal parameters are. You should think of them spiritually as the actual Langlands parameters and the fact that the Langlands parameter should give you um, a stable distribution. But of course, this requires the local Langlands correspondence, which we don't have. So Arthur spends an entire 90 page paper in defining formal substitutes of these, basically by taking the space of which you'd like to have a basis. This is this space V stable that I discussed last time and that we discussed and takes ad hoc a basis for it that has certain sufficient formal properties and then names that basis phi and then that's just it. So, um, you know, it's not, a, it's not a very inspiring thing but it, it is the, the only thing that you can do if you don't have the conjectural Langlands correspondence. Okay. So let me say a few words about how this is proved. Uh, again, if you, if you look at this, you realize that this gives you a definition of what SG should be by induction. You have to prove that it's stable. It's not possible to prove that it's stable just directly. So what do you do instead? You first define those individual distributions as, again, by a sim similar inductive process, but not applied to the entire IG, rather applied to these individual IMGs. You, once you have this inductive definition, you define SG to be either this or that, and then you are faced with the same problem, proving that it's stable, but now you have won at least one small battle. You have won the fact that this SG that you have defined has some structure, as a sum over M. So that opens the possibility to an inductive argument based on the semi-simple rank of the levy. And if you work a lot, you reduce it to the case that m is equal to g. And this is what Arthur calls the orbital part of the trace formula. So then you have to prove that the corresponding piece of that is stable. And that, in some, in some rough sense, is what we did last time, except that now we don't only have semi-simple elements, we also have unipotent elements and mixes, and you have to see how this works. So let me give you just one example. Uh, yeah, let's see if I can do it in five minutes. Let me try and give you the example of SL2. Okay. So for SO2, let's consider the geometric part, um, uh, the geometric side of the trace formula, but the side that uh, the summand for m equals g in this sum over m's. So what does, what does this summand for m equals g consist of? 
So this will be the so-called orbital part. Well, this is going to be sum over orbital integrals, sum of orbital integrals. So what elements do we have here? There are two kinds of elements that we have here. So these are regular semi-simple elliptic elements where we know what this is. This is just the usual orbital integral. This is the volume. And then we have some unipotent elements. We don't have the regular semi-simple hyperbolic elements because they are accounted for by the summons for m being the proper levy. So they have been kind of handled by induction, if you will. We don't have the full unipotent term because some of it was already used in order to make the trace formula invariant. So we have just a certain part of the unipotent term. And then last time we saw that uh, if we just took the regular elliptic part, this we stabilized last time. And what did we find? We found that it looks like this, where here we take, we find the uh, the uh, G regular part. Okay, so this is just a very rough summary of what happened last time. Now, what endoscopic groups do we have here? Well, one of them is just G itself, and the other ones are <coughs> anisotropic tori. Uh, these are and these are going to be g, what do I want to do? We did all the, the whole elliptic term, and we hit g, g prime regular. OK. Now what happens if uh, g is equal to g prime? Then g, g prime regular is just everything. And so here we have as g the full part here plus the endoscopic group that are not equal to G. And here we have the G, G prime regular part of the stable trace formula. Now, what is, which elements are we missing here? Which elements are not G, G prime regular? Well, these are anisotropic tori, so these are, you know, norm one elements in uh, quadratic extensions. And they're the, the two elements plus one and minus one. Those are exactly the elements that are not g, g prime regular. And we're not going to get them from the elliptic part here, but we're actually going to get them from the unipotent part. And this has to do with the following bit of harmonic analysis. What happens when you take a regular semi-simple orbital integral and you start degenerating it as the regular semi-simple element go becomes singular? And what you see is the emergence of unipotent orbital integrals. Uh, you know, you have jump formulas over the real numbers, or you have Schalke germ expansion over Piatti groups. And so a, a regular semi-simple kappa orbital integral is going to morph when you degenerate the semi-simple element into unipotent kappa orbital integral. And so if you add to this the unipotent contribution in the orbital part, you add to this the g, g prime singular part. Okay, so I, I don't know if this is a pointillistic style or uh, modern art or what it is, but I, I, based, I almost said nothing, but I hope that it was enough. Um, say again? I only end up with the s elliptic part because I want to it, I want to stabilize the orbital part and I stabilize it in terms of the orbital parts of the stable trace formula and then the g the m not equal to g parts were stabilized kind of by an induction earlier. That's right. Okay, so what I want to do now in the remaining time, we'll see how far we get, is the application. So application to classical groups. Okay, so what is it that we want? We would like to prove Arthur's conjectures, both local and global, in a suitable formulation for classical groups, and we would like to use the trace formula and its stabilization in order to do so. Um, 
so last time I mentioned that just the trace formula in stabilization on its own uh, cannot really do this. It can get you from Arthur's conjecture to the stable multiplicity formula, which was the conjecture we stated last time, or vice versa, but you don't get both. Now, what we have here is actually something in addition. We have two trace formulas in their stabilization. So we have the trace formula plus stabilization for G classical, and we have the trace formula and its stabilization for twisted GLN. Now, I didn't talk at all about the twisted trace formula, so I'll just I'll encourage you to imagine that there is a similar theory to the one we just described, where in addition to the group G, there is an automorphism acting on the group G, and then uh, you develop the theory to that pair. What links those two things? The fact that in both cases, the endoscopic groups are products of classical groups. And because of that, the equations that you get have the same variables in them, but you just get more equations now. And that is ultimately what allows you to make conclusions. So the first step in this procedure is, I mean, you need to phrase the Arthur conjectures before you can even prove them, but the Arthur conjectures are phrased in terms of Arthur parameters which are conjectural. So you need to introduce formal versions of Arthur parameters. What is the idea behind it? The idea is that irreducible representations of this mythical global Langlands group are supposed to correspond to cuspidal automorphic representations of GLN. And so that immediately allows you to formalize Arthur parameters using cuspidal automorphic representations of GLN. In some sense, this is an empty step because you don't know much about cuspidal automorphic representations of GLN. So in general, this is not really a recipe for success, except that because uh, the endoscopic groups for twisted GLN are classical groups, there is a very close relationship between the groups you're studying and GLN. And so that's what lets you get away with using representations of GLN as parameters. Maybe I'll use this one. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to start decomposing the space of interest according to these formal parameters. So what we have is, we have the space of formal parameters for GLN. And then inside of this, we have spaces of formal parameters for G. How do we single out such spaces? Well, there is various different ways and one has to, in the end, show that they're all equivalent, but one way is the group G being a classical group arises from GLN by a certain duality, and you can use that duality on the representation, on the cuspid representations to say which of those should model formal parameters for those groups. And now we can make the following decomposition. So given a parameter, a formal parameter, we can extract from it two bits of data. We can extract Archimedean data, which will be basically an infinitesimal character. This is for Archimedean places, and we can extract Satake parameters. This is at finite places. And using this information, we can now break up both the discrete spectrum of G that we're interested in, as well as the discrete part of the trace formula, according to these parameters. So the discrete spectrum of G breaks up according to such parameters,
And the same is true for i disk g as a sum. OK. Now, you might say, wait a minute. Isn't the first thing already what we wanted? We wanted to decompose L2 disk into contributions of parameters. But notice that these parameters go over all parameters for GLN. And one of the big theorems that we want to prove is that, in fact, this contribution here vanishes unless the parameter happens to live in this smaller space. And not only that, but unless it happens to be a discrete parameter. So in this, 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 this uh, decomposition here is very simple-minded and very crude. And a, a lot of the work goes into actually refining it to make sure that uh, this summant is non-zero only when the parameter is discrete for g. But it's something. It at least focuses our attention to the individual pieces that we can work on. And then we have the uh, stabilization identity, both for G classical and for twisted GLN. Let me put them all together. Um, it, say again? This is telling you a little bit of something, but basically you're just chopping up according to Satake parameters and infinitesimal characters. It's not telling you too much yet. That is correct. So you do need to apply the trace formula in the end to kind of get this distribution, but it's a mild application of the trace formula. Something doesn't vanish here, something doesn't vanish here. And because you know it doesn't vanish for GLN, it has to not vanish somewhere else. But you don't know where exactly it doesn't vanish for all the twisted endoscopic groups of GLN. So that's somehow the much harder information to get. Now, we had the stabilization identity, which is up here. And it refines in two ways. It refines to the discrete part of the trace formula. This is somewhat formal. You just look at the distributions on both sides. They have a continuous and discrete parts, and you collect the discrete parts. But it also refines according to such a parameter. And you have this for a classical group G, as well as for twisted GLN. And now we come to uh, the actual, the beginning of our actual work. So I'm going to try to convince you in five minutes, uh, I will fail, uh, as that the fact that you can actually prove what you want for at least the simplest possible parameters, namely those, those that are as far from being uh, discrete as possible, then you expect vanishing. And I'm going to try to convince you that you can get this vanishing from these identities. Uh, this is almost a purely global argument. And then once this is done, the real work begins that uh, I can talk to you about privately or in the Q&A, where you get the difficult parameters, which are the you know, elliptic and then discrete and so forth, by doing a lot of local work and combining it with the global work. But here is how you, uh, you do it here. So I'm, I want to call this extracting the payload from chalk doesn't cooperate. Extracting the payload from the discrete part of the trace formula. Remember, this has an m equals g part, which is the discrete spectrum you want, and uh, parts for proper Levy subgroups. But now we're doing an inductive argument, which means that we have proved all the conjectures for the proper levies. And we can take that information and plug it into this and see what this gives us. And so this is the following theorem. It says that let psi be a parameter for g. That is, uh, and, and then g is either classical or twisted GLN. And then we can express the difference between the discrete part of the trace formula and the m equals g part, which is just the trace of r disk psi of f. We can express this in terms of, well, the formula for this and the fact that we plug in everything that we know about the Arthur conjectures. So this looks like s psi inverse sum over s psi, and then you have the Arthur sign 
here you have a size of the vowel, of a vowel group. I, I can explain a little bit about what these things are, but some of it you're going to recognize from earlier discussions. Okay, so this is, this is the theorem that you get. Some of the bits you see, centralizer of, the, of a parameter, arter sign, regular parts of the vowel group, this determinant that we saw before. This here is a key object that uh, I would like to... When did I start Pianry? Did I start sharp or I forget? I, oh, so I have seven minutes? Huh, then maybe I'll manage to convince you of the thing I want to convince you. Okay. Seven minutes to summarize 600 pages. I'll do my best. Um, okay, now this object here is a key object. What is this? This is made of normalized intertwining operator. So it looks like the spectral side with a trace form where you have a trace of an intertwining operator against the induced representation, except now the intertwining operator has been normalized. I'm happy to discuss why one needs to normalize them, but maybe in the Q&A. Also, how one normalizes them, all of these fun things. Okay, so you're prob if, you, if you replace R by M, this looks like this piece of the spectral side of the trace formula. Okay, so now, uh, we can make a corollary out of this. Well, let me first, so... The right-hand side is only defined if Psi is a discrete parameter for a proper Levy subgroup, and otherwise it's zero. So that's already telling you something, that if Psi is not a discrete parameter for a proper Levy subgroup, then this actually equals this. Okay, that's non-trivial information, but it still doesn't tell you that this has the conjectural formula that you want, according to Arthur's conjectures. So let's try to get closer to this. Let's define 0 R disk Psi to be the difference between what we see in the discrete spectrum and the expectation. Let me save time by not writing what the expectation is. The expectation is the right-hand side of the Arthur conjecture, if you remember. All right, so it will be the contribution of this parameter here to the Arthur conjecture. I wrote this last time. And then we get a corollary, which tells you that the difference between the discrete part, the psi discrete part of the trace formula, and this error term here can be expressed in a kind of very similar way to what I wrote here but it is a little bit better suited for a comparison of trace formulas that we're going to do in a second. Okay. All right, so this, this looks much nicer. The reason is because I hit half of the terms in this thing here, so I have to write that for you. Um, Okay, so what did I hide in this I Psi? Well, you can imagine I hit all the terms that you see in the other formula, but not here. So this is this term here, and then uh, the sum over the regular parts of the vowel group. But there is a reason why this is isolated on its own, and you'll see what the reason is in a moment. Okay. Okay, so this is the first half of analyzing the trace formula. So far, we didn't really use the stabilization at all. We only used the formula for the discrete part of the trace formula together with our knowledge of the Arthur conjectures for proper levies, which we're assuming by induction. But now we come and look at the stabilization identity, which I 
wrote somewhere with the disks, so the very top line on the right hand side there. I'm going to focus on this now, and I'm going to also put in the information that I assume by induction, Arthur's conjecture, and in particular the stable multiplicity formula for proper endoscopic subgroups. And so I can replace this as disk prime there with its conjectural uh, value, which is given by the stable multiplicity formula. So here is the theorem. Uh, again, we take any parameter for n. We have not yet found, this is our goal at the end of this discussion, to have vanishing unless psi is a parameter for g. Uh, and g is classical or twisted GLN. And then the difference between the psi discrete part of the trace formula and the endoscopic contribution, where these are the simple endoscopic groups. Let, I'll, I'll say in a second what this means. This is given by a formula rather similar to the formula in that theorem up there. So we're going to look at the similarities and the differences between those two formulas, and then we're going to compare them. So again, we discount by the size of the stabilizer. We have, again, Arthur's sign here, except it's shifted by this uh, Arthur's element S psi. And then we have uh, another sum, whoops, over the endoscopic elements, leaving over x. I'm not clearly not defining all the terms because um, I just want to give you a general impression, and then you're going to see how they fit together. Okay, and then, just like last time, I want us to focus on this final distribution here. Okay, so this is the theorem. And let me tell you what this distribution is. Oh, yeah, I have to tell you what the distribution is, and I have to tell you what this summation index is. So imagine that G is fir imagine first that G is a classical group. Then this sum has a single term, and that's just for the group G itself. So I'm simply comparing what is the difference between the discrete part of the trace formula and its stable version. It is something given by endoscopic, smaller endoscopic groups for which I know what happens, and I put it here. But I also have the version where G is twisted GLN, and then here I have two summons, whose dual groups are SPN and SON. They both embed in the largest possible way in the dual group of GLN. And so I have two such terms here. And all the other terms that are here are twisted endoscopic groups that are smaller. They're products of smaller terms for which I know what to do. Now what is this term here? So here this F prime G psi S. This is easier to say what this is. Remember that last time we had the bijection, the spectral bijection between pairs of an Arthur parameter and a centralizing element, and then an endoscopic datum and a parameter for it. I use this bijection, and I take the stable character for the factored parameter at the transfer of this. OK. And so now uh, we can get to the same corollary, same type of corollary as we did with the, in the previous part, where we know what we expect for these terms. The expectation is the stable multiplicity formula. We don't know it by induction, because these are the largest guys here. In the case of a classical group, this is just G itself. We're trying to prove the stable multiplicity formula. We don't know it yet. We only know it by induction for the smaller ones, which we've put here. So we can form the uh, discrepancy between what we have minus what we expect, which is the stable multiplicity formula that I wrote last time. And then, yes? Are these really positive? Here? I hope they are. Oh, I'm sorry. This is a minus sign. Thank you. Yes, I'm comparing the uh, trace formula with the stable pieces. 
And these are the proper endoscopic pieces that were explained by induction. Thank you. And now I have the same kind of corollary, which tells me that the difference between this and this error term can be expressed in a similar fashion. Namely, I have a formula for it which looks exactly, I want you to compare as I'm writing with the top corollary there, and you're going to see that I'm writing exactly the same thing with two exceptions. The i is now an e, and wh what are these exceptions? Well, we have to compare them. And the f is now f prime. Okay? And now we're ready to reap the benefits of our work. So the first thing we note, there is a combinatorial identity that you can prove directly that tells you that the i up top and the e up here are equal. And the second thing is actually a big conjecture called the global intertwining relation that tells you that these two linear forms are equal. Now this global intertwining relation can be proved for most parameters directly by hand, by inductive arguments. It then gets plugged into these two corollaries and what does that tell you? It tells you that i disk minus 0r equals i disk minus 0s. And that tells you that 0r equals 0s. And I think I'm out of time, is that right? Yes. Okay, because I'm out of time, I'll just tell you that with a simple argument, and I'm happy to uh, say it in the Q&A, from this apply to twisted GLN and to G, you get exactly the vanishing that you want, that for a parameter that is not sufficiently square integrable, all the terms vanish. And first of all, you see that the R0 vanishes, which means that the trace R disk equals the expectation for it that you have. So you've proved Arthur's conjecture. The expectation is zero, by the way, because the parameter is not discrete. And the S0 disk vanishes, which means that the stable multiplicity formula holds. So I'll stop here. For the Q&A, uh, and we take a short break, five minutes break. Maybe uh, it would be good to have this on the, on the recording. What is the condition now, right now? What, what are the... So maybe let's keep this... Uh, if Tasso can answer this, uh, these results are conditional on what right now? Okay, so Yanis is asking, should... Maybe for the Q&A. So. But the Q&A is not recorded, I guess, so... Okay. Let me, let me try to answer. So, Yanis is asking, are these results conditional? And if yes, what are they conditional on? The answer is yes, they are conditional. Uh, should I write here? Or is that okay? Yes. You, okay. So, they are conditional on a number of things, and I'm going to sketch them very quickly. So, conditional on number one twisted and also not twisted, weighted fundamental lemma. The non-weighted versions were established by uh, uh, Bao Chao and Go and then uh, transferred to characteristic zero by Valtz Bourget or by motivic integration, but the weighted is still outstanding. And then they're conditional on some uh, results for simple, in some sense, non-generic local parameters. This is uh, a paper announced in the back of Arthur's book called A27. Basically, what this does is we know a lot about real discrete series. 
And this can be used in the trace formula to understand tempered automorphic representations. But when you want to go to the non-tempered automorphic representations, we don't know enough about real discrete series, so the control places in the trace formula are played by such parameters, and you need information similar to the one you have for real discrete series. And this is not yet, this has not yet appeared, so this impedes progress uh, for non-tempered representations. Say? No, this is a reference numbered A27. Ow! Oh, yes, I'm slow. Yes, you're correct. Expect this in 2027. Uh, you can expect the paper a year early, code 26, um, which is a property of normalized intertwining operators for twisted GLN. We know we discussed these normalized intertwining operators, RP something something. You can define them in the twisted GLN setting, but then you expect that they have a very familiar shape that you can write in a different way, so there is an identity. This operator equals that operator. Well, that has to be proved, and it hasn't been, so that's that. And then finally, it's also conditional on comp compatibility of twisted transfer, twisted endoscopic transfer, Uh, with Aubert involution. The compatibility of standard endoscopic transfer with Aubert involution was proved by Hiraga, but one needs the twisted version of that, and again, one needs it in the handling of non-tempered uh, automorphic representations, and that's built as A25 in the, uh, in the references to the book. So, this is my knowledge of Maybe Asagu wants to add one more. I need to say, oh, yes, yeah, so th there has been work on the weighted fundamental lemma by Chaudoir and Laumont in the split case, but the general case is outstanding. Okay. Uh, anyone want to add to the list? All right.